Uh, I call this meeting of the Pearland Independent School District Board of Trustees to order on August 25th at 11.02 a.m. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. Let the record show that trustees Gooden, Carbone, Decker, and Murphy are present. Uh, now, with no speakers signed up for public comment, the, the Board of Trustees of the Pearland Independent School District will now convene into a closed meeting to discuss the following items posted on our agenda this morning as allowed by Title V, Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code and or the Education Code. The superintendent will present for the board's consideration or discussion of the following matters, sections 551.071, 072, 074, 076, and 082, and those items are listed on the agenda. No voting will take place in the closed meeting. Any action the board wishes to take as a result of discussions in closed session will take place after the board reconvenes an open meeting. It is now 11.03 a.m. and the board will stand adjourned into closed session. Members, if you would go directly into the second link and we'll go ahead and get started and we'll be brief. Thank you. The board will reconvene in open session at 11.55 a.m. No action was taken in closed session. Let the record show that trustees Decker, Gooden, Carbone, Botkin, Murphy, and Barry are all present. Is there a motion to carry over from executive session? Yes, sir. I move to approve the superintendent's recommendation of Ms. Rusty Mathis as principal of Cockrell Elementary. Motion. Is there a second? Second. Carbone. Second. Carbone. Any further discussion? Hearing none, let's vote. Trustee Murphy, how do you vote? Aye. Gooden votes aye. Trustee Carbone? Aye. Trustee Bodkin? Aye. Trustee Barry? He's connecting to audio. He's connecting to audio. Okay. Trustee Decker? Aye. All right. Let me give Jeff just a a second here to connect in. Trustee Barry, are you uh, with us now on audio? Mm -mm. Okay, so Trustee Barry, one going once, going twice. All right, we will record that vote as 5 0 with Trustee Barry present but having technical difficulties. Uh, so I understand that uh, Mrs. Mathis is with us. So uh, congratulations. Uh, we're looking forward to your success and the campus's uh, continued success. And, you know, it's a challenging year to be starting as a principal, but we, we know you got it. So thank you very much. And congratulations. Congratulations. Yes, ma'am. Let's see. I see her right there. Okay, uh, Mrs. Mathis, you're, you're open if you want to unmute yourself and uh, have a few words. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. It's going to be a challenging year, but it's going to be a great year in PISD. Awesome. Awesome. And Charles Thank had you. started that way because I told her, don't worry, you won't have to say anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. All right. Hi, Charles. <laughs> Okay. All I, right. For some reason, I got put in as um, as just a participant, not a panelist. So you couldn't talk. Anyway, okay. I hear you. All right. Well, well. So, Miss Mathis, you you've got you're the first person in history to get five votes, and then the vote closed, and then another one come out. So, uh, you you got well, well unofficially you got six zero uh, unanimous. Awesome. Thank you so right. much. Have a Thank great day. Thank you so much for joining us, ma'am. You too. All right, members, that being done, the item on our agenda today is an update from administration on uh, the COVID-19 metrics. We were, of course, having um, our medical panel develop metrics to help guide the superintendent in his decision making. And then we'll also be discussing related return to school matters, uh, of course, associated with the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Kelly, I will uh, yield the floor to you, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh... I'm thankful I've got a couple of people that I'd like to see most of my time to. One is uh, Dr. Decker, who served on the medical, uh, who's serving on the medical panel, and also uh, John Palumbo, who is the principal of Paraland High School. Uh, I've asked John because of all the campuses in the district, he has the highest number uh, of students that uh, would start 
in the phase in next week. But before we get there, if I just make a few uh, just uh, informational items uh, regarding all of this. First of all, right now we have a total of 20,348 students registered. Um, that number is creeping up each day. Uh, we hope to get to, uh, for, for planning and funding purposes, a total of um, about 21,700 by October or November, which is usually the, the high point of the year, attendance-wise. Of those 20,348, we have 9,846 that have chosen on campus and 10,502 that have chosen remote. So um, the majority, I didn't calculate that percent, but 52% or something probably greater than that uh, have chosen remote. Um, this week, uh, we are in a different situation than many districts. Many districts have started this uh, Monday. And so uh, what we have going on this week is primarily staff development for teachers and others. And that uh, is true for today through Thursday. And then on Friday right now is intended as a teacher work day. As you, if you've been following the local news, um, the, the potential for uh, Hurricane Laura has affected primarily the districts around us, meaning those south of us, Alvin and South and uh, Clear Creek and South from there. And so uh, many of those districts, if not all, have already decided to uh, shutter for tomorrow and Thursday at least. So um, that does not appear necessary for us right now, although there are employees who live uh, south of us and they would be released to go and make whatever preparations they might need in case uh, the hurricane does hit in the Galveston Bay area as, as they are saying is possible. Um, so forgive me for just changing topics on, on all these related things. Uh, the DAEP board, I know you've asked me about this before, for the audience, DAEP is the district housed uh, place that students go for certain levels of offenses. The newest guidance from TEA is, is, uh, is different. And basically what they're saying is that if a child uh, begins the year remotely, then the DAEP must also be conducted remotely. So we're trying to figure out how that will happen. That's a very strange thing to um, have a disciplinary school, but the kid is essentially at home uh, expected to um, uh, participate remotely. Um, we have finally made a decision back and forth. We've argued this point on the uh, on a fee for the devices, uh, the tablets that we're uh, uh, disseminating to all of our uh, all of our kids. And the decision is we are not going to uh, charge a refundable fee, although that is permitted. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to publicize a list of charges that would be incurred if uh, there's damage caused by the student. And so uh, we would expect that to be repaid if there is uh, are those damages. Um, now, uh, I don't know if Mr. Barté is uh, with us. Um, Greg, are you there by any chance? And uh, Kim, can you unmute him if he is? Um, Dr. Kelly, he, I, don't, I don't see him in the meeting, Dr. Kelly. Okay. That's okay. Well, then let me give you a figures board as of yesterday. Um, 280 I iPads have been shipped and uh, 4,500 Dell tablets. As of yesterday afternoon, he had received 432 uh, Dell tablets. And uh, the best part about all that is um, we will at least be able to meet the needs of those who um, didn't, do, just do not have a device or do not have access to the internet, much like we did in the spring. And the, the improvement over the spring is that we're handing them essentially a brand new machine as opposed to the older machines that we gave out last spring. So um, I, I, uh, many districts right now are in a long period wait for the devices because of the massive number that have been ordered and because of relations with China. But we appear to be uh, looking like we're gonna get a large volume, whether um, how soon uh, is still a little bit up in the air. Um, Mr. Bardet could explain further, but, but uh, that's where 
things sit right now. Um, of course, the most important thing is that next Monday, we are starting remote learning for sure. Uh, the on-campus we'll talk about uh, a little later about the phase-in, but um, under any circumstance that we can imagine, uh, remote learning uh, starts on, on Monday. Um, uh, we, we, yesterday, all of a sudden, a group of parents emailed me and they wanted to have access for kindergarten parents to walk their kids into school on the first day of school. We cannot allow that. That would cause very large uh, congregations of people going in on, on the day when we need to be the most safe and the most secure and the most orderly as we begin the year. So uh, unfortunately, we know that uh, that parents love that and need it. But I will also tell you, I, I, please take this in the right way, that veteran teachers and principals will say essentially that the trauma of the first day is more the parent's trauma and not the child's. We'll take good care of that kid as they enter our schools. Um, board, you will uh, be more involved in this on September 8th, our, our regular board meeting, but we will be bringing to you the required asynchronous plan that we in turn must submit to TEA. And uh, that plan has been drafted and is pretty much near final, uh, but we'll talk about that um, later. Um, I think, uh, Mr. President, uh, maybe the next thing would be to talk uh, about the medical panel and its work. Um, uh, just, uh, just like to say up front, uh, the group that we've assembled, uh, they spoke at the last, uh, board meeting, I think, or July 28th meeting, I think it was. And we thank uh, Crystal and others for putting that together. They've done some outstanding work. And then we've added to that group, uh, Christy Beck as the facilitator, uh, Dr. Lisa Nixon with special ed, and a uh, official from the Brazoria County Health Department. Um, and a Dr. Meter, uh, Marcy Meter. Uh, and all of those folks, I've read through some of the emails have really had outstanding contributions. Their work is near completion. However, there's some uh, local data that needs to be added and to be refined and to be uh, sure that we're accurate about. And so we don't, uh, we don't have an absolute final answer on that uh, today, but there is some moderately good news in terms of trends over the last uh, 14 days and some other things. I, I think I'll leave some of that to, uh, to uh, Dr. Decker, uh, who is a member of that committee and uh, who I've asked to sort of serve as spokesman uh, here. Um, so uh, Dr. Decker, if you're prepared, if you would uh, also, Dr. Decker, I don't know if you want to go into this level, but we, uh, Kim Hocutt has the ability to put the chart up on the screen that uh, we're using, uh, y'all have devised for uh, the metrics. Uh, Dr. Decker. Yeah, I think that'd be great if, if we could see that chart. All right, very good. Uh, Kim, can you put that up there, do a share screen? So um, we uh, deliberated a whole lot on this <laughs> to uh, try to come up with numbers that seem reasonable, not too conservative, not too liberal. Um, and from the first day we started working on this until currently, we still are kind of um, finding holes in the system. And, and a lot of that's just related to things that we can't control, such as our availability to get certain numbers, how accurate are these numbers, and so forth. And so there's just a lot of different factors that, that uh, feed into this. Um, as you can see on the chart, uh, we've, we've broken it down with, with the best of our ability into different uh, level of community transition, transmission of the disease and how risky it is. And, and these are the best numbers we could come up with. Um, and that's what we believe is going to be given data from the county itself. So numbers that we get from the county, um, and we, again, are still deciding, should we use only Pearland numbers? Should we use Brazoria County numbers? Um, is there a big difference between the two and, and so forth? But um, these were, were ranges that we came up with um, using um, different numbers from around the country of, of uh, larger scale epidemiology studies. Um, and so this is what we came up with our area. Um, we have uh, 
two main columns. One, one is incidence rate, um, which is the average daily new cases per 100 people, 100,000 population uh, measured over a rolling 14 day period. Um, and then we also have the percent positivity rate. Now, um, both of those numbers are not necessarily as straightforward as we would like them to be. Um, again, I think we're gonna settle on using county numbers most likely uh, to help us come up with the uh, incidence rate. Um, and right now our, our current incidence rate over um, a rolling 14 day period for Pearland is sitting right around 17.4 given the Brazoria County cases. So that puts us in the moderate uh, range right now. Um, the county uh, 14 day uh, range is 22.5. Um, so there seems to be a little bit less uh, a number of cases in Pearland is reported in the rest of the county. Um, the seven day uh, uh, average, I calculated that as well for Pearland is 12.6, which means that the last seven days is better than the, the previous seven days. And so we're, we're still seeing that downward trend, which is good for our, our community and our district. Um, so that kind of sits us in the, in the moderate category. Um, we are having a hard time um, finding how we're gonna come up with our percent positivity rate. We've had some issues um, in getting those numbers. And so uh, we may or may not be able to even use that, that column uh, of category about positivity rate. So I think that's where we're sitting right now. Um, on the right, we have some, you know, the recommended instructional models based on whether elementary or middle school, junior high or high school age uh, kids. Um, and so the rest of that's kind of self-explanatory. Um, obviously the, the riskier things are, the higher the risk, uh, the, the less we believe the kids should be um, doing in-person um, learning. And the, the lower the risk, then uh, the more liberal we can be with, with the kids in the classroom. And uh, Dr. Decker, uh you know, just judging by the statistics that you've used there for your first column, you know, we're somewhere in the low moderate to moderate phase and it fits in with our, this is more in the form of a question, but it fits within our plan, which is essentially that 25% uh, of our students uh, who have elected on campus would be coming to school uh, next week on each of the first uh, four days of the week. Right. Um, and of course, you know, I can, I can go into those numbers further with the board in terms of what that looks like on a campus by campus basis. I think I emailed that to the board last week, but um, when, you, when you have the majority of, of uh, students choosing to do remote, then one fourth of the remaining students is a relatively low number uh, everywhere in the district. Um, Dr. Kelly, would you give a couple of examples uh, yes, about what that quarter percent, I mean, a quarter uh, yes, session sir. looks like? Um, and I got, I just got these numbers this morning. Right. Uh, you know, I've asked Dr. or uh, Mr. Plumbo to uh, be here partly because he has the greatest numbers. So let me uh, tell you about that. Um, he, uh, he has, uh, 3,029 students that are registered to attend uh, Paraland High School, whether it remote or on campus. Of that, 1,739 are, have chosen on campus. He has a very, okay, there, oh, thank you, Kim. <laughs> uh, so the on-campus instruction number there for Paraland High School at the very top shows 1,739. If you divide that by four, then you see the number of kids that are potential for the first day next week or the first week. And that's 435, essentially. Dr. Kelly, can you help me understand, um, are teachers, students, and those of special need categories added into these numbers as well? Yeah, all kids are added in there. So this is um, including the on-campus instruction is those even including teacher students? Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. No, I mean, I, it's not that refined. There will be some uh, exceptions to the rule for special education, uh, severe cases, life skill kids, or behavior problems. And there are a sprinkling of kids throughout the district that are um, employees' kids that may be attending every day. But I don't think that greatly affects any of these numbers. 
Okay, uh, so you don't feel like it's enough numbers that it skews these percentages that greatly. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, I, you know, I, I'll just round off. Uh, John Plumbo can maybe be more precise, but I'm going to say probably let's let's take that number 434. It's somewhere around 450 by the time we get to the first day of school, both by uh, the, the type of students you just described, but also registrations that have not yet occurred. A lot of folks wait until not only the first day, they may wait till after Labor Day or later to enroll. Um, so that gives you an idea. Now, let's contrast Pearland High School there where the, the majority, a strong majority are on campus. Look at the very next line for Glenda Dawson. She's got, uh, uh, Kelly Holt there has um, 1,072 saying on campus and uh, 268, uh, yeah, 268 saying, uh, or dividing that number by four. So in other words, she has a capacity of about 2,600 kids at Dawson High School. And of that 2,600, about one-tenth would be on campus starting next uh, Monday. Of course, that number will go up a little bit or down a little bit, depending on different decisions between now and then. Um, but she's got the vast majority, as you can see there, 1,407 uh, uh, who are going to begin the year remotely. Um, so, uh, and as you look down the column, I, I, I like the column that I created. I, I, I received this spreadsheet from others and I added this column for a number of on-campus kids per day just to give you an idea of one-fourth looks like in reality. And so you'll see, for example, uh, let's look at uh, Silver Lake Elementary. You've got 58 kids coming uh, the first week and, uh, or two weeks at this point. And um, those, uh, that's in, in a school that normally uh, has capacity of eight to nine hundred kids. So it gives those campuses the opportunity to get procedures and safety requirements and all kinds of things, routines in place with a low number of kids uh, before the third week where one half come uh, Monday through Thursday. And then after that period uh, of time, then of course all kids that are listed as the on-campus instruction number. Uh, obviously, we would be sensitive to whatever the medical panel comes up with. For example, uh, as they pointed out in some of their deliberations, uh, it is possible that if there's a spike in cases or something that the phase in period could be extended or reduced in the sense of saying we're going to have an even sparser number of kids per day on campus than what we're projecting and all of that. So um, I, I don't mean to preempt questions, but um, if you want to see where the rubber meets the road, then that's why I've asked Mr. Palumbo to participate and kind of tell you how this impacts the campus with the largest number of students. Are we ready to go there or do you have questions first? Go uh, Rebecca. Go ahead, Rebecca. Yeah, I wanted to see if the board had any questions. Yes, ma'am. I just, I just want to point out that, you know, in July, I pointed out that the second week, um, One third. the numbers are not at 25 percent that they're yeah. actually going to be at 50 percent so um and you were looking into that so i don't know if that is still being um looked at as far as going monday uh tuesday through thursday to tuesday through thursday and doing the in essence 33 percent or if you're going to go tuesday through friday and it be the 25 percent or if you're still saying that tuesday and wednesday are going to be 50 percent and then uh, thursday is going to be a, a quarter Yes, I think very, that our parents need to know. Yes, what we're right doing. now, the very last thing that you just went through is what we plan to stick to, which is the 50% ruling on that second week for uh, uh, that shortened week because of the holiday. Um, that's where we're at right now. Um, subject to change depending on, uh, on pandemic updates. And, and Dr. Carroll, can I, um, I can add a little bit to that just from a campus perspective. We, for us, it's actually only about a third of our kids because we've got a, a portion of our kids already staying home, one remote, and it's going to be fifty percent. Uh, we like that option a little bit because it gives our teachers a, a taste of what it's going to be looking like when we get a little bit of an increase uh, the following week on week three if we stay on that track with regards to the phase in model. And so it gives them an opportunity to kind of test, look at seating, what's it look like, how do I adjust as we get ready to move forward. Um, 
And so it also helps us with procedures. What does cafeterias look like? It gives us just a little bit of time versus we have to turn it around the next day. It gives us a few days to kind of adjust to that, but it only is actually a third of our kids. It's about 900 kids uh, for our campus that would actually be on campus that day uh, compared to the other days when it's roughly going to be about 450. Not holding. Um, so if, if parents elect to not send their kids because they don't want to, they want to buy that extra week, they can join remotely and not be penalized for any type of attendance issues, right? Absolutely. And that would be our encouragement as a campus. We're going to encourage our parents that if, especially if your teachers are live streaming, we've been testing that out a lot and we have a plan for meet your teacher at Pearland High School on Tuesday, but that may be a little interrupted by Hurricane Laura. Um, but that's uh, one of the things that we're planning as well as is that we want to have that flexibility because if we have a kid that's an in-person kid and test positive, they can still stick with the uh, joining in live uh, for instruction as well. And so that's our plan. Not all of our classes will be live, uh, but a good portion of our classes will be, especially our cores. You know, uh, let me just add one thing there, and it's a district-wide uh, thing. In this strange new world we're entering, Attendance may be the highest ever recorded because anytime a kid is absent, theoretically they can they can then participate remotely. And so, um, whereas in previous years you're there and you're in attendance and counted as such, or you're not. But um, with the with the switch to asynchronous and synchronous remote instruction, theoretically you could be at home uh, and uh, have some mild condition of some kind and continue to participate uh, in in the remote instruction for the day. Uh, John, uh, again, I don't want to interrupt any questions, but I was going to ask you to kind of go into uh, social distancing, um, class sizes, and some of that kind of thing. So currently right now, just in its own average, some classes are a little bit different than others. Um, you know, for our campus, our advanced courses, we have a little bit higher percentage of kids that are actually coming in person. Uh, we're running about 65% of those kids. But with the phase-in model, with the starting, we think we're going to be roughly between four to seven kids per class, uh, depending on the class period, um, for the first two weeks. And then once we get to the 50%, we'll be closer to uh, eight to 16 in a class. Uh, but once we get to week five, if, if tr think trends go well, uh, we anticipate that our classes will average roughly 17 to 21 kids per class. Uh, with regards to starting week five once the phase in period is over if we don't continue the phase in period um, so that's kind of our numbers and what we anticipate over the coming weeks and john given given those realities for um, with the, your average size classroom what does that uh, compute to social distancing wise? so we feel really good about the phase in time the phase in <laughs> for weeks one through four we'll be able to socially distance our kids they won't be within six feet uh, and so we have the room to do that in our classrooms. Uh, we feel very confident in that with the numbers that we're going to have. We think as long as we stay below 12 to 14, it depends on the class itself. Some of our classes on one side of the building are a little bit smaller than the other side. Um, so sometimes it's classroom specific, but we think if we're below 12 to 14, depending on the class, we'll be able to socially distance the kids um, six feet apart. It's once we get to the full, uh, full go of uh, on-campus kids coming, um, once the phase in period will be over, uh, at that point, we probably won't be able to social distance in a good bit of our classes just because of the numbers that would be on campus for us because we're a little bit closer to 60% uh, here at Paraland High School with people that are selecting to be in person. Uh, John, uh, one thing that I've heard from other superintendents who started earlier than us is that their number one problem during the first week, well, there's two problems. One was class schedules that people are, you know, different circumstances emerge and, and people's schedules need to be changed. Uh, so any comment that you might want to make on that, uh, what you see coming? Well, I think the difference between us and a lot of different districts is I've got some friends that are in other districts that are uh, campus principals and their, their problem that they're running into is because of the fact that they're peeling off their virtual kids and they're having them strictly go into a certain section with a teacher and they're all virtual, it's creating more problems with regards to their scheduling. For us, it's been a whole lot easier because we've decided to pivot from that and really allow us to kind of do this live synchronous, this live streaming uh, model that we're looking at. It's brought our numbers down in our classes. It's provided us a lot more flexibility with scheduling. And we haven't run into a whole lot of issues 
And we think even if we've got a flow back and forth uh, or even at the nine weeks, because that was a big concern for us as campuses, as high school campuses, it would have been a massive undertaking to make all the schedule changes on if parents chose to go one way or the other and trying to move them into those sections. So now it's really just we're flipping a kid from online to, uh, to in-person or in-person to online. Uh, and we've got a lot of flexibility. For us, we feel pretty good with the scheduling on our side. Uh, well, this is unrelated to just uh, Pearland High School, but the other main issue that superintendents have um, spoken about is, is that big problems with the learning management software with the huge volume of kids attempting to sign on the first week. We don't know if that will happen with our particular platforms, Canvas and Seesaw, uh, but I think our message out to the public is please be patient with us during this first week as we work through a whole lot of uh, issues from scheduling to uh, computer availability and other things. So let me stop there um, and, and board members, you may have questions that, uh, that you'd like to have us address. Members, the floor is open. I have, a, I have just one question uh, that's come up several times. Um, there was an email sent out by different campuses asking um, parents to bring their device to to school, the same device that they're using at home and i've had some parents say that they would be using a desktop at home because that's what they answered on the questionnaire do they have a su sufficient device but what if they don't have a device that they transport back and forth or do you feel that the it stuff will be here in time uh from a district point of view uh, john you can answer this from your your campus but from a district point of view we we're not counting on those devices being here right at the start and we'll, we'll be in a situation similar to where we were in the spring until we have all those devices and then they have to be imaged and distributed and lots of other things to have happen. So our, our focus in the first few weeks is uh, to get devices, to make sure that those who do not have devices at all get them. The idea of bringing forth your device back and forth from school, which apparently is, is something that virtually almost every grade level um, wants to see happen, I think is going to have to be, to use our famous word, phased in, because a lot of people are going to be in different situations where, okay, I, yes, my kid can sit here at home and do his homework on our desktop or our laptop, but I'm not putting that kid on the bus with the laptop. And so we're going to have to uh, adjust to that reality. John, I don't know if you've got any other thoughts? Yeah, I think it's I think it's two different things uh, from what I'm understanding. You know, we, we are asking for them to bring devices in and specifically like if you're using a laptop and things of that nature, something that's mobile when we get here. Once we get one to one instructionally, we're going to want our kids bringing their devices because that's going to be the modality that we're going to move into once we get to that piece. Um, so I think it's important for parents to understand that, you know, if if they only have a desktop and their child's eventually going to come to school, they may want to look at opting in to getting the one-to-one -one device from the district side because that's where we're going to go, um, you know, because it's going to make it a lot more seamless for teachers. Or in our preparation, what we talk to our teachers about is that this is, this, this is the re realization that we're living in right now. Not all kids are going to have technology right now. And so we're going to have some kids that are in-person kids that you may need to make like a weekly packet that you give it to the kid on the day that they come if it's, you know, they've only come in on Tuesdays early on so that they can take that work, go home, do it and bring it in and have some flexibility with the grading uh, with regards to the kids early on on those assignments um, that they may actually have some hard copies and, and be using that up front. But once we get fully rolling out on the one to one, we're going to probably transition as a campus that we want kids bringing your device every single day. But if you're coming to school, because that's how we're going to be teaching you, we're going to be voting everything through Canvas. We're going to expect submission through Canvas. Uh, and so that's going to be where we're going to end up. But there is going to be some kind of a phase in uh, with regards to that as we get ready. Yeah. Well, guess well, my Dr. Kelly. Oh, sorry. Well, no, I guess I just want to clarify because the, the communication that's being sent out now, not necessarily Mr. Palumbo's campus, but other campuses, more middle school and junior high type campuses, is that they are to bring their device starting from the beginning. So the message really isn't, you know, we're going to phase this in. So the questions I get are, how do we bring a device, you know, if we're using a desktop? So, you know, if we're going to phase it in, maybe the communication that comes out at the campus level needs to be more clear that eventually this would be what we need to do, not starting from day one. 
Yes, sir. I will um, get that message out. I, I haven't seen that particular message, but I will get it out. Uh, also, I would like to add, different from the spring, with, with uh, a lot of the remote instruction being much more robust and comprehensive and synchronous in the sense that they're watching what the teacher is doing live or, or so on, uh, there's going to be households where you have three kids as opposed uh, to one, whereas in, in the spring, you might have had those kids doing different things at different times. You need them all on the machines at the same time. In those cases, we ask uh, parents to notify the campuses so that we can get more machines to them up front. So uh, in other words, they become a priority. Uh, along with those who are needy and economically disadvantaged and so on, or who need hotspots. Um, other questions, folks? Yes, sir. Mr. President, if I may. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have some questions kind of across the board. Um, first, I was wondering, what's the teacher's responses? I've seen a lot, a variety of feedback, kind of feeling their stress level. And I know a lot of our teachers are really good at what they do and they have a level of perfection that they expect from themselves about how to implement these new practices. Um, Mr. Palumbo, can you talk at all about kind of where, what teachers are feeling on your campus and um, maybe that's an indication of what's happening in the rest of the district? Yeah, I, I would say it's it's probably split all the way across. Actually, I've started doing a survey with my staff on Fridays just to say, how are you feeling today? You know, are you feeling great, good, fair, a little bit of anxiety, a lot of anxiety? Uh, and it's pretty evenly split um, across the board. And so I think it's just, it, it's the unknown. I think it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of recreating that we're doing as, as educators. Um, you know, with every process, it's every day we come up with something new that we've got to find a new process. For. And so I think there's that anxiety level. And I think it's because of the, the high expectations that they have as educators and they want to provide the best for their staff. I mean, their kids. Uh, I took some time yesterday personally with our staff and we had a faculty meeting and I just basically said, hey, guys, start slow. You know, just start slow. Let's get going slow. Build confidence in yourself. Build confidence in the kids. And then once we get comfortable, then we can start moving, especially once we get to one to one. I think we're going to, be able to move a little bit faster. Um, but I think it's it's all over the place. Uh, we're trying to work as a campus to touch base with our staff, make sure they're good and they're ready um, for the school year and to meet the needs of our kids. Um, so it's really a wide range um, to say that it's one way or the other. It's not skewed one way or the other. Uh, it, it's pretty evenly distributed uh, with regards to our staff. Okay. Dr. Kelly, are you getting a flavor across the district of similar feedback or? Um, yes, similar to what John says, I, I would say one hopeful thing, I, I think I'm hearing from uh, principals and in turn uh, assistant superintendents is that teachers and staff feel better after they've been on campus for a few days and are in the middle of things. Um, you know, it's sort of like that sometimes the anticipation is worse than the actual event. And so I, I think people are, ex are expressing that. I don't want to... Uh, yeah. under emphasize there is a, a, a continuing level of anxiety there you know I I, I try to tell uh, those parents who you know say let's get all of our kids in school and let's start that you know it's easy to say that maybe for your one child or, or for your family but there are teachers that are going to be surrounded by a large number of kids and staff from day one mm -hmm. and so uh, we need to be mindful of, of, of that anxiety as well. And have you um, heard any change of trajectory about how we're going to implement instruction or is it becoming more firm, this idea of teaching in person and teaching remotely at the same time? Well, uh, John might be able to answer that for, for Pearland High School in general. Uh, it's been surprising to me that people are really wanting to, uh, and when I say people, uh, I'm talking about teachers, uh, wanting to try out this combination of remote and synchronous at the same time, even though we have some skepticism about how well that will work. So my message out to, to everybody is, okay, well, let's go with this, but let's be ready to pivot if it doesn't work uh, or if it needs adjustment. John. Uh, yeah, I, a lot of my staff want it, uh, actually. And, and the main reason is because they want to provide good quality instruction to their kids, but more importantly, they want to be able to answer questions for their kids because engage. I mean, I think that's the most important thing that a teacher does is besides delivering the instruction, 
adjusting and helping explain and helping kids understand and learn and just posting information and hoping the kids get it. Our teachers really want to be engaged with their kids um, and, and trying to provide as best as they can and also to, you know, help kids be successful and work through their issues or their concerns they may be having or the minor questions that they can answer and then now the kids get in the content and, and can move forward. So uh, I think there, there's a want to do that. I think, you know, we're all kind of a little skeptical of will the technology hold up? Uh, we're willing to pivot to if, that, if that's not the case. Um, we're hoping we'll be able to do the uh, meet your teacher on Thursday because that was going to be kind of a test run for all of us uh, with regards to, um, you know, whether it's actually going to work, helping kids learn how to log in, where to go, uh, and then also our teachers kind of live streaming and see how that works. Um, and so we think it's going to work pretty good. Uh, we've tested it a good bit on our campus individually, and our teachers have tested it individually with their colleagues. Um, but until we get a volume, we won't really know how it works uh, with regards to that. And you know, uh, Crystal, let me, add, let me add a couple of quick things to that. Uh, and this I hear, especially from the elementary level, uh, the teachers have a great vested interest in having the same kids. And so as they move from remote to, uh, to on campus and back and forth, they feel better and, uh, about having those same kids each day. Uh, there's also a safety consideration there, and that is that the cohort remains the same right. uh, as they move back and forth. Whereas if you uh, uh, do a different, where you have remote teachers separate and completely from on campus, then you've got people changing their cohort all the time. Uh, so um, not a perfect world, but it seems like it's a good way to start and see how well it works. And I guess it's important for me to hear that we have sort of a, a back, a second, a plan B. I mean, I think it, in theory, it's going to work better in a high school or, you know, um, junior high or high school setting, just because the nature of sort of this um, seminar kind of setting with kids. I think I'm most anxious or not anxious is not the right word, but I have most anticipation for the our elementary schools where, especially in those lower grades, kindergarten, first, second, those kids are purposely being moved around the classroom all the time to engage them in a learning atmosphere in a different way. And I'm, I'm anxious for those teachers about how that integration is going to happen. But it sounds like that we have a plan B in place that should that just be a nightmare after giving it a try, that we have some options to kind of lean back on, question mark? And, to and something else just to add to that uh, that we we plan for is, is we're asking our staff to load either videos, record your lesson, pre-record it or record it live and then upload that in the afternoon. And it may be just the lecture. It may not be a 47 minute class period for us. It may be a 15 to 20 minute lecture or just, uh, demonstration of the content. Uh, to go along with it so that that's the backup plan so for whatever reason if second period biology we're not we're having issues those kids can at least go asynchronously grab the content and still stay on pace later on so that's something else that we've planned uh with regards to that Helpful. you know to be fair crystal also i want to give the maybe the opposite point of view from some teachers and that is those who are very anxious would love to see remote only positions open up. And at this point, we do not have remote only positions. As, as we just explained, there could be a pivot in that direction at some point, but at this point, uh, we're trying this method out. Okay, so we're given this uh, uh, option, the full kind of support of the district, and then if changes need to be made, that we'll consider those at that time. Yes, so and I, I've tried to emphasize with principals and assistant superintendents, listen to your teachers, uh, let them be creative. One size fits all does not necessarily go across this whole district. We're not gonna be sitting up here in the central office just conferring thou shalts on all these kind of things, but rather, you know, let's, let's see what works. I, for example, with John, I trust his leadership completely on what works best at the high school level, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to accommodate that as we go forward. And from a facility standpoint, um, do we have enough power strips and things in those high school classrooms to actually plug in those devices throughout the day? So many of our teachers already have power strips because kids charge phones. Uh, and so for us, I don't think it's gonna be a major issue. We're kind of assessing that right now and looking at, is that something we need to invest in as well? Um, but for the most part, most of our teachers already have power strips because they allow kids to have charging stations for their cell phones. 
Um, and so kids will have that opportunity and there are outlets in the classrooms as well uh, that they could use. Okay. And if I may, can I go back to the um, slide that was created by the medical panel to kind of dig in a little bit further there? Yeah, Kim, can you put that up there? By the way, guys, uh, Christy Beck and uh, John both need to exit, if possible, by 12.45. Uh, they've got other, uh, other crucial meetings <laughs> taking place. Understood, understood. Uh, Mrs. Carbone, do you mind if I sneak a question in while that slide is coming up? Um, on the technology piece, Dr. Kelly, you talked about moving from a refundable fee to a sort of a damage driven fee. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I wonder how we're going to be able to uh, look out for our economically disadvantaged families. Um, you know, our tendency on all those kinds of things on fees in general is to mm -hmm. make exceptions for economically disadvantaged kids, but we also, you know, we don't want that message to be too all encompassing and broad because we want students and their parents to feel responsible for those instruments and not think mm -hmm. that, you know, dropping them or smashing mm -hmm. them is going to just give you a new machine the next day. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, yeah, as best I can answer that, Charles, is yes, we will, as we do with all fees, have exceptions. Okay. Okay. So Thank while you, we're working, yeah, no problem. While we're working on getting that back up, I'm wondering, like, um, the most when we're in this moderate phases is 50% on campus, but at least two, and even the high, I guess it's high, high moderate, moderate. So low moderate will give us more bandwidth at the elementaries. But if our case count goes up to where, um, say, Shady Crest and Rustic Oak right now have about 60% that are choosing in person instruction, how are we gonna make decisions about um, what's above that 50% as far as in-person learning based on the numbers that are presented by the medical panel? Well, um, I, I can't really give you a, like a formal process on that at this time, but I would say this, that uh, if the numbers point in the direction you're, you speak of, then uh, two, two, two possibilities remain. One is to go to total remote learning for that particular campus or area of the district, or two, to uh, create a more sparse uh, uh, participation, meaning that uh, a lower number of kids would be on campus per day. Um, those are not good news to most parents because they have routines and daycare needs and so on, but in that situation, we would uh, have to take one of those two options. So what I hear you saying is we're prepared to sort of wax and wane our educational model based on what's happening with COVID over the next school year. Prepared is the word I would uh, like to say 100%, but we, you know, safety comes first. And so a hard decision could be, you know, said in three or four days in advance of a coming week that uh, we're going to pivot to uh, remote only or, uh, or a sparser, uh, daily presence. But th this is true all across Texas. It's not just for us that are using the hybrid approach. Um, when there are a significant number of cases at any particular campus, that in turn may cause that entire campus to go to a uh, remote only. Uh, and we're learning from TEA. TEA and CDC do not agree on that, some of those uh, uh, rules. Uh, for example, uh, TA says you may close a campus for a maximum of five days. CDC says you should go up to 14 days. So some of that remains uh, in flux right now. Okay. Dr. Dr. Kelly, Carbone, could, I, could I ask about, your, was your question about updated closing metrics? Um, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, it looks Sounds like to me from what the medical panel, Dr. Decker has talked about that we're sort of in a phase of low moderate community transmission, which means that going kind of stepping into this hybrid model um, is a viable option for us right now. And it seems like from what I've been seeing and Dr. Decker, this is a question I have for you that our trajectory is continuing to decrease. So it looks like we could get closer to a low model should things continue on the trajectory that they're on right now um, in which we're will be safe to continue kind of proceeding as normal but I guess my question was you know with 
campuses already having more than 50% signed up, which are a few in the district, um, if we have an increase at all with Memorial Day holiday and all of those kinds of things, we're bumping into a moderate phase at which this data is recommending a max of 50% on campus. And that's already above our threshold because of the number of parents that are signing up for in person is already above that threshold. So I was wondering, what are we going to do in that case where we're just starting up and if by the time we get to week three it's in the moderate phase and we're saying i can't handle 60 percent on campus oh, remember this if i'm following your math there it's 50 percent uh in the in the third and fourth week it's 50 percent of those who have chosen on campus so right. it's not 50 percent of the student body um so which is so it's a significantly a lower number uh, for example, in, in uh, John's case, um, we'd be looking at uh, 868 kids, according to today's calculations, um, that would be under that particular decision. Uh, but I think, Crystal, um, I know I'm being a little bit vague, but, but there are two things going into this. One would be paying attention to these metrics that our panel has developed and making decisions based on those. But the second one is that as the year begins, I think a lot more weight is going to be what is happening on specific campuses and in the district. Uh, in other words, if, if we begin to have a positive COVID cases, we're going to have to make decisions separate and independent from what the, the situation looks like in the community or on these metrics. Um, and I, I don't, I, I think was your problem also, uh, your question also directed to Dr. Decker. I didn't want to, uh, uh, Yep, I'm just wondering, Dr. Decker, do you are your is it correct to assume that we're seeing a lower trajectory kind of on the downhill side of the curve that we've recently experienced? I think so up to today. Um, I think that just about everybody believes that when schools open up, we are going to see an uptick. Um, so we just don't know what that uptick is going to look like. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that these are the best numbers that we could literally just, you know, pull out of thin air based on, you know, the knowledge that we have and, and very limited experiences around the country from other areas. And so um, I would expect that over time, as we see, you know, what community spread and how that affects the schooling model um, and how those mix together, um, it, it would surprise me if we don't have to even adjust our recommended numbers there in that far left column, um, really within the first several weeks, uh, once we see what's really happening. Okay. And Dr. Kelly, do we have is, a plan? This is my last question, Mr. Goodman. Yeah. And have sure. it. Do we sure. have plans for um, posting this on our plan to proceed page, as well as a list of the names of those participating on that medical committee? Uh, yes. Uh, um, yes. Uh, the, my hesitancy in, in putting that chart on there yet is it's not completely finalized yet. Uh, we would like to add the two data points. Uh, uh, as Dr. Decker pointed out, he's got uh, several data points for that first column, but the positivity rate percentage is not solid yet. Sure. And so, uh, you know, putting up a chart without the numbers that show where we're at isn't, isn't that useful. But as soon as we, hopefully within the next day or two, we'll, we'll have a better sense of that. And then, yes, we can put the uh, medical panel uh, that contributed to this uh, uh, on the website as well. We're very, very thankful for all their work. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Decker, you, uh, I think you had a question a second ago. I did. Um, Dr. Kelly, I know that um, you have to have board approval to extend um, any type of remote or hybrid learning for the additional four yeah. weeks yeah. once we start. Yes, but then has there been any other talk um, or have you heard anything from TEA, uh, TEA to allow us to even go further than eight weeks? Well, uh, the first part of your question there, on probably at the September 8th meeting, I may just advance a kind of a thing to the board where it says, if needed, we the board uh, would like to, the waiver to be in place to allow us to go from four weeks to eight weeks on the phase in. That would just protect us for whatever uh, we do in the future. Beyond the eight weeks, which is the second part of your question, 
I would just say that right now there is pressure being put on TEA and probably including by the legislature to make that uh, much longer than eight weeks, but nothing has, has been decided or finalized on that uh, at this point. So I guess the hybrid then would only still remain for the uh, ninth through 12th grade high school. If yeah, we very good point. At this yes. point. Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, the, the ability to extend beyond the phase-in uh, program at the high school level is somewhat unlimited. We can say, you know, you're coming and you're not. But with all the other grade levels, the hybrid only lasts the first eight weeks of this year, and that's only if the board approves a waiver for that final four weeks. Trustee Murphy, Trustee Barry, Trustee Bakken. Floor is open if you'd like to take it. May I slide in one more question? If Ron? not, I'll get, yeah, I'm, 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 I was going to, yeah, go ahead, jump, uh, okay. slide one. <laughs> My uh, only other question, Dr. Decker, have you guys um, reviewed as the medical panel sort of the metrics for um, particular school openings and closures of individual campuses across the district? Across, like, um, trying to take the data and, and really hone it on around Silver Lake or around Grand High School, no. Or um, individual kind of did, like as the case count waxes and wanes on particular campuses, do you guys have, have you talked about recommendations there? Yeah, well, we did um, discuss recommendations. Um, in fact, we had a whole other table put together that um, looked at community transmission and, and what we would recommend the schools do um, as far as, you know, should they close or should they not? Um, but we the more we looked into it, I think the more we learned that, um, you know, the CDC has guidelines out there for that. Um, and a lot of it's just going to be really individualized based on um, discussions with the health department and, and you guys saying, okay, this is what's going on in this school right now. We've had three cases in three different classrooms. They don't appear to be related. Um, I think that would look a lot different than three cases in one classroom that, that demonstrates spread between students at the school level. So um, yeah, we, we, uh, at this point, um, I think leaving it more individualized is probably the best thing to do. Okay. Sounds yeah, good. Crystal, let me add one thing too, and that is uh, Christy Beck told me this uh, the other day, and she may have already needed to uh, move off to another meeting, but um, local data, there are some uh, questions about it because for example, uh, some pharmacies, I think, I think she meant pharmacies are reporting data to the state, others are not. And so it's, it's been difficult to make, to, to ensure the accuracy of, of uh, getting into areas of Pearland and determining if, if, if that is a apples to apples comparison. Understood. Thank you, sir. Okay, Dr. Kelly, I had a, a few questions I wanted to run through. i go back to technology. Do you have a number of devices that we have issued to students? Uh, no, sir, I do not. You mean for, okay. uh, for so far already this uh, right this period of time? I do not. Right. I can get that to you. Okay, but okay. thank you. Um, I, I want to understand how, how far we are getting those, like you said, those families that responded that they have no technology at all. I want to see how we're doing with getting technology in their hands. Kim, uh, um, if, if you've got a chance, Kim, and you can email Greg Barte and get an answer on that quick, that'd be helpful. Yes, sir. I've, got a, I've got a little bit of an answer, uh, Dr. Okay. Kelly. Yes, sir. Um, so they are, since they started receiving the Dell tablets early, uh, they've been imaging those and there's a plan for Friday, Saturday, Sunday this week to start deploying those. We're actually calling our kids as we speak right now, or uh, our staff is reaching out and calling our kids that have requested. Uh, and I'm assuming that other campuses are doing the same thing. Um, so we're in the process. I think they're starting with high schools just because we're a, a larger capacity at this point. Okay. Um, and then they're going to start moving down to the lower levels and distributing those to the remote online learners first. Uh, and then in the coming weeks, I'm assuming that we will start receiving our one-on-one, one-to-one -on -one tablets, and we will distribute those to our in-person uh, students. Okay. Um, Dr. Kelly, I just moved Mr. Berger over um, to, if he'd like to contribute anything, he, he knows kind of the plan that technology is doing. Yeah. It's very similar to what Mr. Palumbo was saying. Uh, we were, we had 1,200 of the plan B old laptops imaged ready to hand out, but we didn't want to hand those out and then turn right back around and have the families come back up to get the one to one devices that have been expedited to us. So we are looking at handing out about 1200 devices this weekend. Okay, 1200 this week, okay. 
All right. Yes, and, um, Charles, just to, I want to add while you're on the same subject. Um, sure. What about the, I mean, is there an alternate plan if, if we do get a hurricane? And, I mean, because obviously the plan right now would be Friday, Saturday, but uh, we haven't really mentioned the hurricane when it comes to picking up devices if that goes through. I just want to, want to make sure we have an alternate plan. Well, the alternate plan would be that we do it uh, during the school. When, once school starts, right. we start the next week. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. And Mr. Berger as well, do, do you have an idea of – so we have 1,200 devices that we're getting ready to get out uh, right now, and those are the Plan B devices, right? No, sir. We are, we are anticipating that the one-to-one -one devices, we will have enough of those to hand okay. out the 1,200 that need. And then as okay. they come in, we will image and start at the high school and work our way down with the one-to-one -one devices. If okay, by chance sure. the one-to-one -one devices do not get here as projected, we will hand out what we have one-to-one -one and then hand out the Plan B so that the students have a device. Okay, and have, has Dale, since we got more devices coming from Dale than we do uh, Apple, have, have they given some kind of expected date for, this is when you'll have all 18,000? Uh, the issue is, is actually with the DHL delivery, not mm -hmm. Dale, we are trying to get an ETA, but the delivery notice has been terrible. Uh, and so we are okay. pushing that vendor to give us a, a concrete ETA, but we have not received that. Okay. Okay. So it's not a production deal. It's, a, it's a, the bottleneck is in. Yes, sir. The uh, Dell has sent okay. out, and I believe the number was 6,000 devices so far, as far as they've been processed, uh, palletized, and, and shipped. They're just not an ETA on when they will arrive. Okay. And now between COVID and a hurricane, that's the excuse. Yeah, made. it's pushing that back even further. Okay. Um, Dr. Kelly, I had a question about the uh, synchronous versus asynchronous uh, instruction. And I think I'm getting two different messages or maybe I'm getting confused on this. But when we start, you know, we're gonna try, like Mr. Berger said, we're gonna try to get devices in the hands of as many students as possible. So day one, August 31st, when we start, is there gonna be any synchronous instruction? Um, I haven't checked on that in the last couple of days. Um, okay. You know. The idea, of course, is that that is a superior method of instruction than the asynchronous. Okay. But okay. Um, I don't have a good update on that right now. Okay. Um, Dr. Kelly, I just moved uh, Dr. Watson over um, if okay. she has anything. Okay. I don't know if she wants to add anything. <laughs> Maybe. She's muted. Yeah. I you... remember when Dr. Dr. Watson's update at the last meeting was extremely yes. helpful, but I'm, I'm trying okay. to for Pearland High School, we're encouraging kids, if you can live stream, and we're encouraging teachers early on, if you can live stream, let's start testing it early because we're going to be taking it slow. We're going to be really introducing into like Canvas for us. You know, where do you find Canvas? Doing more fun, get to know you activities is our plan for Pearland High School. Yeah. But we're going to have an asynchronous option for kids that may not be able to get on live stream if it's a multifamily home and they only have one device. So we're going to have that, but we're going to encourage kids and families, if you can get on a live stream, go ahead and do it from the first day because we really want to start testing it and getting everybody used to that as we move forward with regards to uh, rolling out the instruction that we're going to be doing. Okay. The other okay. thing, uh, now that maybe you comment on this, is um, we're having our people develop video lessons to kind of cover the uh, asynchronous uh, need during that first week. Anyway, Nyla, you're muted, Nyla. She's not muted. Um, it looks yeah, like she was having. Try again, Nyla. No. Yeah, yeah Doctor Watson, I think it's a Hi. microphone issue because you're not muted right now. Hold on, Doc. We, we still can't hear you, unfortunately. All right. <laughs> Doc is jumping into uh <laughs> okay. Um and so on the on the issue in the devices, we're going high school first, uh not necessarily highest need, or is it highest need in the high schools and then going down that, that way? For uh device distribution? Yes, sir. We would want to serve all the high school. What we want is we want to have enough to serve the population of the high school and then work from building to building to give everybody the devices. 
But if it comes in piecemealed, we would start with the remote learners because they are the ones that need it the most. And you're muted, sir. Makes sense. Yes, sir. Makes sense. I got a train coming by outside here. So, okay. Makes sense. Um, okay. The next question was, how are we going to, what's our process for updating our metrics or updating our data throughout the, the year? Is the medical panel, Ms. Beck, going to be uh, re responsible for taking care of that? I think initially we're, we're sort of, we need to crawl before we can walk. And so we're going to rely very heavily on them over time. They may be able to tell us this is where you get that data and we can do it independently of them. The most difficult uh, thing for the uh, medical panel that uh, Christy has explained to me is these are some of the most high powered, busy individuals in our entire community. And so getting them together for a meeting all at the same time uh, has been challenging. Uh, we end up uh, with, asynchronous meetings <laughs> with uh, with uh, some of these folks. But I, okay. I think that'd be my thought. Dr. Decker, I don't know if you want to comment further. Or... And my concern is just keeping the data fresh. Like we have our data source from the, from the, from the, from the county and just, it's not so much that we have to get the panel together to, you know, the brain trust has to come all back together. I'm just concerned about how do we keep our data fresh so that we have uh, we know exactly what it is that our community numbers are. That, that's the process I'm asking about. Well, uh, well, that, that's that, that's something we can we can we can address. But as we go along, I think it's important that we you know figure out how to how know, to handle that. Yeah. Charles, I may be wrong about my own projection here, but I mm -hmm. think that a lot of this is going to move from what's happening in the community to what's happening specifically in our schools in terms of number of cases right. and, and so on. Right. I think that's going right. to be the bigger determination as the year proceeds. Right. And my, and my last item was on that, um, on that note, if we could talk a little bit about what our notification processes and procedures are going to be uh, just so that parents, I know they're getting that information as, you know, as meet the teachers and all that stuff is happening. But uh, what what is our what are our processes? What can people expect to see if there is a positive on their on their yeah. campus? I'm going to call a friend here if he's available. Uh, Mr. Moody, are you there? Kim, if you'll move him in and have I'll him check. help yeah. him out here. Uh, let me see. Yeah, let me move him over. Yeah, he's got his hand. Raised. I got him. There he is. <laughs> Way to go, <laughs> David. Uh, you're you're the most up to date on the on the whole uh, notification stuff. Um, what we do know and what we don't know from TA. You want Thank to comment you, about that whole notification process? Unmute yourself. No. There you go. All right, okay. David. I'm here? Yes, sir. I'm still learning this thing. Okay. All right. All right. That was perfect timing. I have a one o'clock meeting. I was getting ready to drop. So, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so let me kind of explain, uh, Mr. Gooden, uh, what, what, what we will do. We're going to follow TEA. We've been working uh, as a team. We have about eight of us in the in the ESC that have been working together. Part of that being Dr. Nixon, uh, Ms. Beck, Mr. Berger. There's a crew of us in HR that are all working together on how we're going to communicate. Um, positive, uh, I'm assuming you're asking a positive COVID case. Right, right. All right, so what happens is, is when we get indication that an employee or a uh, student has a positive case, um, one of the first things that will happen, depending on how it comes to our attention, because that could come many different ways. It could be that our employees at home and they confirm that they've got a positive case and, you know, uh, let their supervisor know. But I'm going to go with one that is going to be probably most common, that while an employee is at work or while a student is at school, they become symptomatic. Mm -hmm. They're going to get sent down to the nurse. Um, and well, obviously, you guys have employed a nurse for us in HR. Um, we're going to, our nurses will go through that process of determining, you know, what are the symptoms, making sure the best they can, uh, and our nurses are more qualified to do that, that we don't have a student that potentially has got allergies or, you know, some other, you know, we've got the whole fall season of the other elements that take place, but all of those elements we recognize fall into the, the symptoms of COVID. So, but at some point they're going to be sent home uh, because they are symptomatic. We're going to monitor that student. Once that student has become, or the employee becomes what we consider positive, meaning they have gone to get a test and they're confirmed positive, the first thing that we'll do at that point is notify, uh, our principals will notify the employees on the campus. So everyone will get a notification. It's a TEA document. 
and TEA, um, as you know, is going to be tracking this. We're waiting to hear more from them in the next uh, week or so. And I think we'll have more direction on what they expect and how we're going to be transparent with our community. But right now, we've already been sending those letters out. So if we have a positive case at, at a campus or a location, we send what we call a lower, I've been calling it a low exposure email, a uh, low exposure letter. And then what that letter does is let the location, so it won't be necessarily going out to the whole district, it'll go out to the location where the positive occurred. So if it was an ESC and it was employee, only ESC is going to get that letter. Meantime, the nurse at the campus, the nurse here in, in ESC, we were starting that process of uh, contact tracking, right, to make sure that who were those close contacts, those six feet, 15 minutes. Uh, once those individuals are identified, they get a separate notification. So everyone will get the notification that, hey, there was a positive case at this location. That just confirms that there was, there was a case that took place there. We're not able to give a whole lot more than that. We cannot identify who the individual is. We really can't give a whole lot more to, for example, I can't say it was assistant principal because basically we're identifying who it was. It was an employee at a campus or a student at a campus. The close contact notification will be separate. It's a separate letter and a phone call will occur, occur off of that too. So if, it, that if that's a student, then the parents will be receiving a phone call to let that parent know that the student was identified as a close contact. And that's done through you know, the nurse, the APs at the campus, the principal, the counselors, whoever's going to be involved. And there's a big training that goes on tomorrow with that to actually talk more about what this contact tracking look like. But they're going to be involved in that process. <laughs> they're going to be com communicating with that student the best they can to understand where was the student, what class was he in. That's why it's really important in a lot of our classes that we have those assigned seats and the things that we need to make this as easy as possible and we can respond as quickly as possible. So then you get the close contact letter and those individuals will be uh, sent home as well to be quarantined at that point. Those are the two main, there's other communication that goes on with a positive case. We're obviously going to be uh, communicating with those employees, with those students on how their health is progressing before they can come back. Um, so there's other people, you know, uh, Mr. Berger, Ms. Beck, uh, if they're still on here or not, they can maybe add to it if need be, but um, we're going to do our very best to communicate and be transparent about what's going on in our school district. Thank you, sir. You, you mentioned letters. Will those be going out as emails? Yeah, and so, no exposure let, so yeah, okay. let me explain that. Um, we're, we're working towards getting the letters where they'll be automatically sent out, right? But uh, right. parents on that low exposure letter, that will be sent through Skyward. Okay. So they will, they will receive that through Skyward. The uh, principal and the directors, if it's something happened here at ESC right now, what I'm going to do is send that, that email will probably come from HR to notify everybody at ESC that there was a positive case here. The principals will send that to their employees. Larry, you have anything to add? The only thing I wanted to add to that, one of the questions was asked when we moved from kind of a community spread to a specific campus spread and looking at our numbers and our matrices to see what we're going to do. Uh, we have purchased a forethought health management system that's going to help us with this uh, tracking process and it will run reports from us for us based on each campus, student positive case, student close contact cases, uh, staff positive cases and whatnot. So we can run specific reports for each campus based on COVID exposure. Okay, so that's going to feed into what our medical panel is looking at. You said it's called forethought? For, yes, sir. We have a forethought. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a suite of software programs for HR, and they've developed a health module that will help us track COVID and run reports. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and, and then I guess my bottom line question is, you know, looking at the metrics that have been developed and hearing what the uh, medical panel has said, they are in agreement that we can move forward with the phase in and they're, 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 they're in agreement with that. Yes, we are. All right. That's just I guess okay. it's unclear at this point that what are those metrics going to look like for those individual campuses after we proceed with opening. So we've got the kind of right. green light for proceeding, but then once we're in the procession, like what stops that procession sort of thing? Yeah. It sounds like you guys are working on that and going to be giving us guidance as we move forward with yeah. more clarity on that front. One of the challenges is that um, 
the day that school starts back up, the numbers that we rely on our metrics, they will change because we'll probably be getting more testing from more kids across the district. You know, anyone who goes home with a runny nose or a cough or a sore throat or a fever, those, a lot of those kids are not getting tested right now. They probably are going to be incentivized to be tested now that, that it could get them back into school if they're proven to not have COVID. And so that's going to potentially increase our numbers. So just that one little thing that happens uh, can, can change what our recommendations are. Um, another thing is, is that as more um, healthcare facilities uh, implement uh, rapid testing, um, as of last I heard, the Brazoria County, when we reported rapid test results, they report, they record them as a presumptive positive, but not a true positive. So if we get more and more rapid testing that's um, happening across the community, we're not going to see those numbers necessarily in the numbers that we're using to, uh, I guess, help our decisions. And so, um, again, it's just there's a lot of moving parts and, and trying to track those down is going to be really difficult uh, moving forward. So it's more about sound data sources, it sounds like to me, than not necessarily that you guys don't have an understanding of what those metrics need to be, but trying to track down the source of what is the actual number for our community that's more of the problem. Right, it's one of the problems, uh, for sure. Um, you know, I think that if, if we keep the data consistent, well, we're going to see up and down trends, and, and that's going to be helpful. But if our, our data source is inconsistent um, because of whatever reason, then that's going to um, uh, make it more difficult for, for all of us. But it sounds like that's a kind of a national issue, like with in issues of testing giving false negatives or data not being inputted, or it sounds like there's gonna be some ongoing issues with reporting over the length of this virus. Right, which is why I think what Dr. Kelly said earlier was is probably pretty spot on. You know, it's it's going to probably be a little bit less important um, as time goes on. You guys are going to see what happens in the schools, and the administration is going to know, hey, this is either working or this is not working. And I think that's where it's it's going to go. And then again, trying to figure out, okay, if we have to scale back um, how many kids are in the schools, when's it going to be safe to scale that back up? And so. There's a lot of moving parts, and I think um, you know just staying nimble with this is going to be the most important thing. Yeah, I guess that's the part that it's difficult because it's not necessarily like you said about the number of cases, but about the layers. Like, if this per kid is got the virus, and then we contact trace to one other that he got the virus, like how many layers before we say, okay, an outbreak is coming in the school, why don't we shut it down now versus waiting for the outbreak to happen? I mean, but I guess that's where I'm depending on you guys to kind of give guidance as to once, w it sounds like we have some great data collection points with the new software and all of those things, which is awesome, but knowing when to kind of close it down without being too overly cautious, but cautious enough that we're not propagating a community spread, I think is of paramount importance too. And very difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think, Dr. Decker, what you it's you, it, there's a lot more nuance to it uh, than what I was looking for was if this, then this, and that's the, the end of the story. But it's there's a lot more nuance to it to understand what it is that you're looking at from the data. So I I, I understand uh, where you're coming from with that. Uh, okay. So. Um, we do have, let's see, Dr. Nixon, I know you, you joined in as a panelist. Did you have anything you want to share? And uh, if not, that's no problem. Oh, the audio. Dr. Nixon, we can't, we unfortunately can't hear you either. <laughs> For some reason, right now you're not muted, right. but we still that's can't that. hear you. There yeah. you go, there you go. Ah, okay. Turning it off and on works. Uh, I wanted to let you know, you asked about notifications. We are also required to notify the Brazoria County Health Department. So we have a flow chart um, that our group has developed under the guidance of Christine Beck that the Brazoria County also shares out. So anytime we have positive cases, we share that with the county as well. So even though we're doing our own COVID tracking at the campus level, Brazoria County is doing the official contact tracing in the community. Okay. okay. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kelly, did you have any, anything else, any wrap up comments? Well, not on that subject, but I did want to take, since we still have about 80 people on board, just to say something about uh, hurricane prep, if, if, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Uh, yes, sir, of course. Um, I just want to caution folks that uh, we are likely to make decisions that could be very different from uh, districts that are south of us and east of us, because at present, uh, we're forecast, those who are west of, of uh, I-45 and in our a location in north are projected to have one to three inches of rain and that's the the effect and not necessarily have um, substantial wind that may change it may change in the two hours that I've, I've been in this meeting but um, the reason I point this out is that Alvin Clear Creek and all of the districts south of us are essentially closing down already for Wednesday and Thursday part of that reasoning for them is that they already have kids coming to school and they're closer to the coast and closer to the potential path. So we'll be, uh, I, I moved from this meeting into a meeting about that uh, and we'll continue to, to look at it. But right now, the only uh, thing that we need to do at this point, since we have staff development going on this week, is to release any employees who are south or east of us that need to go home and make preparation. That may change uh, by tonight, but um, that's where that sits. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, members, any other wrap-up comments or questions? All right, uh, Mrs. Uh, Bobby Dawson, I know you're, you're in listening for us. If you would note the record to show that Trustee Decker left the meeting at 12.51 and Trustee Barry left the meeting at 1 p.m., that will get all of that squared away. All right. Thank you all very much for your time. With no further business to come before the board, we will stand adjourned at 1.15 p.m.